Good evening, everyone. And I say good evening advisedly because I realize even for our presenter, Dana McDonald, who you were seeing on screen moments ago, uh, it's late afternoon. And those of you on the West Coast, it's late afternoon. And those of you further afield, uh, it might be the middle of the night or the morning for uh, those in Australia and New Zealand who've been joining us recently. But here in Toronto, Ontario, where I, where I am, Tim Grant, your host, uh, it is decidedly the evening and a very cold one yet again. Uh, but a warm welcome out to all of you for joining us. Uh, you're in for a real treat tonight with uh, Dana's presentation. We had, she and I did a, a practice session two days ago, and I was incredibly impressed, and I think you will be too. Um, and before I introduce Dana, let me give you a sense of where we're going tonight. Um, we are, she will, when I turn it over to her in a minute or two, uh, she will begin her presentation, probably 25 to 30 minutes in length. And then we turn it over to you for your questions uh, to Dana. And the place to ask those questions is in the chat box, which is that box in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. And those of you who've been on a Green Teacher webinar or will be familiar with the chat box. Uh, but for those who aren't, uh, there's below it, in the bottom, extreme bottom left-hand corner, there's a horizontal blank box. And that's the place to ask any questions that you're having uh, have of Dana. You don't have to wait until the question period to ask them in a chat box. I'll certainly be paying attention uh, to anything that you type there. But you'll also comment on things that she says. And, and, uh, and if you're having technical difficulties, by all means, use the chat box to let me know, and I'll do my best to help you with it. Um, and so uh, the other thing I should mention is that we, uh, we will, at the end of the 60-minute session tonight, uh, we will have a sort of end of webinar survey that I'll ask your indulgence to fill in. And uh, it takes about 90 seconds or so to fill it in. And those that do indulge me in that uh, effort will be eligible to win one of two free uh, one-year subscriptions to Green Teacher Magazine. And if you're not familiar with our magazine, it's a, an unprofitable, I, I jokingly say, an unprofitable nonprofit magazine. We've been publishing for youth educators around the world for the last uh, 20 years. And Dana, if you can just advance the slide there. Um, and it's a place where youth educators around the world share their best ideas uh, for educating kids from ages 6 to 19 inside and outside schools. And in the last 10 years, we've had the privilege of working with a, a large number of educators and publishing six books. And if by chance you're not yet a subscriber to our magazine uh, or a user of our purchaser of our books, I'd strongly encourage you to do so. Uh, at the very least, one of the benefits is that you'll help ensure that we're able to continue doing this, uh, providing this webinar series uh, for free for for any and all uh, who can make use of these particular sessions. Um, as someone asked in the chat box already, you don't have to take notes. Uh, we, will, um, we will be archiving, as you heard, uh, this presentation uh, and sending all of you an email tomorrow uh, indicating that the archive version is available and how to access it. And please take advantage, especially if you like the presentation. Please let your friends know that anyone can view this webinar for the next 30 days uh, for free. You don't have to be a Green Teacher subscriber. And we hope that, um, that many, many people will do this time. Now, without further ado, it, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dana McDonald. Uh, she is the Green Space, her official title is a Green Space Project Manager with, that, with an a quite a remarkable organization called Evergreen. And she works out of their Vancouver, British Columbia office. Um, she's a water resource scientist by training with great experience in academia and the private and non-for-profit sectors. Um, she's, through her uh, quite diverse work experience, she's learned the importance of hands-on uh, experience, interactive dialogue, and thinking about the world as a complex and connected system. To me, that, that alone makes her an excellent webinar presenter. Um, but with Evergreen, uh, she works with a team of educators to bring meaningful learning experiences about nat urban natural spaces to communities and schools. And I have to say that uh, we started Green Teacher Magazine about 22 years ago. And shortly thereafter, this organization called Evergreen emerged uh, initially in Toronto, but now has offices right across Canada. And for those who are joining us tonight from outside of Canada, you may not be familiar with this quite remarkable organization that has been doing 
are really quite initially focusing on schoolyard greening, and they remain kind of Canada's go-to place with that particular topic. But they've really their larger mandate has been about how to help uh, Canadians, particularly those of us who live in urban centers, get reacquainted with the natural world. And their their work in that regard is multifaceted. And, uh, and really quite remarkable and innovative. We're going to come back to that uh, later on in, in uh, Dana's presentation. But Dana, I'm so delighted that you accepted this uh, this opportunity, and uh, and I know that uh, I'm really pleased to to, uh, to welcome you to tonight's webinar. And I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight with uh, Green Teacher and all of you who are joining us from all over North America and the world, even. Um, I'll just go ahead here. Um, I just wanted to give a brief overview of what we'll talk about this evening. Um, quickly chat about who is Evergreen and what do we do, although Tim gave a really wonderful introduction there. Um, and what is Uncover Your Creek, which is the program I'm going to use as an example today for um, water quality monitoring and outdoor education. Um, and then we'll get into some nitty gritty things about why you would want to want monitor water quality, um, how to select site, um, things you might want to think about like community partnerships, um, some tricks of the trade, and then making your program meaningful. Um, we'll also have a, a starter list of resources and similar programs uh, that you can use as examples and, and um, a place to get tools. Because um, really anyone uh, can do this kind of work. It's, um, it's really valuable and I'm excited to be here tonight telling everyone about what we've been doing here in Vancouver. For those of you who are unfamiliar uh, or have just arrived in the, the chat room, um, Evergreen is a national not-for-profit organization that inspires action to green cities through a wide variety of programs. Um, this includes the Toyota Evergreen Learning Grounds, which uh, many of you who are teachers may be familiar with. Um, this program has supported the greening of over 3,000 school grounds across Canada to create vibrant outdoor spaces. As well, we have our Green Space Program, and this is just one of the four areas that Evergreen works, uh, works in. And Green Space operates nationally to engage volunteers in a variety of stewardship activities, including on-site experiences at the Evergreen Brooks in Toronto uh, and our stewardship and restoration programming here in Vancouver. Today, like I said, I'm going to use our Uncover Your Creeks program uh, as an example. And this has been delivered in Vancouver since the fall of 2012. And we'll be moving to Toronto this year, um, uh, which is really exciting for all of us here at Evergreen. The Watershed Champions program um, focuses on water-based education. Um, the program aims to connect students and their local watersheds by supporting teachers with resources to engage their classes in learning, um, learning to care about their local watersheds. Um, this is a program that is administered nationally and includes a website that features free webinars, um, much like this one, uh, lesson plans, helpful publications, teaching tips and strategies as well as an award that classes can apply for. Canadian elementary and middle schools can apply for the RBC Evergreen Watershed Champions Award to recognize their work and be awarded money towards environmental initiatives at their schools. Um, the program and this webinar are generously supported by RBC's Blue Water Project and the Canada Coast Community Foundation. So uh, now I'm really going to dive into what we're doing here. Um, before we get started, I want to invite everyone to let us know where you're from uh, uh, in the chat box to your left, like you mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, also tell us what is your experience with water monitoring with youth or in your community. This will help us let us. This will help us to know uh, who's out there and what kind of inspiring projects you're all working on uh, out there in your own community. I wanted to give. Uh, a little bit uh, more detail on, on myself, uh, just in case anyone has any questions later or uh, so you know where I'm coming from. I, uh, like Tim mentioned, I'm an Evergreen Project Manager uh, in the Green Space team. Uh, I've been working here since the spring of 2012, but volunteered here for a year before that and really got my feet wet in a lot of different uh, aspects of the organization. Um, I'm trained as a geomorphologist. Uh, for those of you unaware of what that is, it's the study of changing land surfaces, and my training focused on stream dynamics. I studied the amount of water that flowed and when it flowed and how much sediment it carried in the high Arctic of Canada. Uh, and there began my love affair with streams, um, being outside and then for two months at a time. 
Uh, from there, I moved to consulting and worked on surface water management in Alberta. Uh, I began learning water quality sampling methods in earnest there in remote areas of the oil sands region. And now here I am at Evergreen, um, combining my background uh, with community engagement and education through stewardship. Um, we've delivered uh, many stewardship events, public dialogues, and soon we will be having an urban watersheds forum uh, for any of you here on the West Coast wanting to join us on March 21st for a celebration of World Water Day. Uh, we'll be engaging lots of folks uh, in that forum. Okay, now diving in. So Uncover Your Creek um, is a regional watershed education program in BC's Lower Mainland. Um, we operate mostly in Metro Vancouver. Uh, we have monthly stewardship, uh, stewardship events in five watersheds around the region. And this includes not only water quality sampling, but invasive species removal, um, native species planting, and, water, this, and the water quality sampling. Uh, as well as part of that program, we have twice annual public dialogues in each watershed to engage those people who really want to be part of the conversation but don't necessarily want to be getting their feet and hands dirty and wet on weekends. We also take our workshops and, and education content to elementary, middle, and high school classrooms. Uh, we work also with community groups engaging youth at risk. Um, and this type of program can also be very successful with youth groups at community centers, uh, church youth groups, and with the general public. Um, it's very easy to adapt and very inclusive. And later on in the presentation, I'll let you know what kind of kit we're using and where you can get it. Because it is very easy to, like I say, adapt to any other group that you may want to engage. So I'm going to begin with the, the question, why would we want to monitor water quality? And many of us here today may, for this very uh, basic reason, want to use it as a tool for awareness and education of our classrooms or our communities. Visiting a local ecosystem is a great way to connect the landscape to understand the, eco or the interconnections between organisms and humans that are either in your urban environment, which is where we administer this program, uh, or in more rural environments. Even if you're only able to visit a stream one time or irregularly, taking samples and connecting with the stream and its surroundings, understanding the role of ecosystems and discussing impacts holds a lot of value for increasing awareness about our impacts on the water bodies, the importance of them, and the actions we can take to conserve them. Visiting a stream regularly, uh, it's possible to establish a data set through which you can assess the health of that stream. And this does tend to require a higher level of commitment, but can also have very high rewards. So the second reason to monitor water quality, um, the second of four that I'll talk about today, is to establish a baseline of data. Um, and this is a, a data set that you can then compare to future samples. Sometimes your regional government, a municipality, or a local group conducting research will already have this information that you can use. So if you're only able to go to the stream one time, you still have something to which you can compare. Most streams will have a characteristic water quality profile that reflects its surroundings and varies within a range with rain and snowmelt inputs or low flows. Um, and this is the range that you'd be trying to determine when you're establishing the baseline. The baseline doesn't necessarily reflect the natural state of a stream, since we can't be sure what suite of impacts are, uh, the stream has felt without any analysis. But it does tell us about the current state of the stream and acts as our baseline for future studies. The third reason we might want to water, monitor water quality uh, is to diagnose the water body health. By taking a series of water quality samples over time, we can paint a picture of that, that water body health. And that series of samples might be the baseline that we just talked about. That series should capture the seasons, storms, and low flows to incorporate natural variability in the stream. Um, when you examine the samples, you can compare to other streams to determine how healthy your water body is compared to something that is under uh, similar conditions. Remember that to monitor means that we are returning regularly to that stream. One sample represents a snapshot in time of the condition of that stream. But most streams, water quality varies widely over time, depending on weather, pollution, and other factors. So we must understand that a single sample represents just that moment in time rather than the whole picture. 
By connecting with local groups or researching similar streams, you can understand how the health of the stream was studied and compared to others like it. And the fourth reason we'll talk about today uh, is to monitor for pollution. Um, so when you have a baseline and a sampling plan established, you can monitor for changes that occur. Many streams, particularly those in the vicinity of cities, agricultural or industrial areas, are impacted in some way by pollution. It's rare, in fact, to find streams now that are, aren't impacted even by things very far away. When we monitor a stream regularly, we can capture variability in water quality and work to pinpoint sources of pollution uh, and help to mitigate future impacts. So I'm going to move now into talking about um, how you might plan to start a sampling uh, regime or to, to simply get your class out into, uh, or youth group, out into a stream uh, one or a few times. The basic, basic methods are the same no matter where you are. Uh, what differs is what samples you might take, how you plan your sampling, and the safety precautions that are necessary. So first I want to talk about choosing a safe site. Um, if you're going to initiate a regular sampling regime, someplace that you can get to easily during class time, to and from work or school or on a quick trip on the weekend is the, the ideal. Um, with respect to safety, the size of the water body doesn't really matter. Larger ones can seem more intimidating, but actually sometimes they can be easier to grab water from. Um, what you're most concerned about is access and the flows. You want to find a site that uh, has a clear, safe pathway to access the stream. There should be a gathering place large enough for your group on the bank so no one is on slippery rocks, mud, or in the water, and no one's trampling on the vegetation around the stream because that's an important part of the ecosystem. A sandy or gravelly space on the edge of the stream is ideal to avoid damaging the plants in the riparian zone and stirring up things in the stream unnecessarily. So in Scarpier Creek, we work with students of all ages and with the public. Um, we tend to have a ratio of about one adult to 15 youth, um, but you may choose to have a lower ratio with younger students, uh, especially if they're in an unfamiliar space. Uh, one thing that I've taken with me from my time in, in uh, the corporate world and for our occupational health and safety is that um, slips, trips, and falls are the number one way people get injured on site. So making sure your site is uh, accessible and safe is important. Weather and seasons. In Vancouver, we sample all year round. Uh, it rarely dips below zero for a period of time where it would get icy and treacherous out there, uh, although we have had several cold snaps this, this winter. Um, if the streams are open, you can sample anywhere, but safety and access will still apply. Um, thinking about clothing, making sure everyone has weather-appropriate clothing and shoes that they don't mind getting wet and dirty. And this seems like a very obvious thing, but the number of times I've seen volunteers and students come out into the, um, into the field with sneakers and a sweatshirt uh, on a cold, blustery day um, is, is innumerable. <laughs> um, staying warm and dry is essential to happiness and success. Um, I am a person who, as soon as my feet get wet, I become really, really intolerable. Uh, so I make sure that I'm always dressed appropriately for these things. Um, uh, as well, always bring a first aid kit with you, know how to use it, and know how to contact your nearest emergency response group. So I wanted to talk a little bit about unpredictable conditions near streams. Um, the weather in the days before, be aware of the weather and, and check it in the days before um, leading, leading up to the sampling. In urban streams, which are connected to the stormwater system and convey water from impermeable surfaces all around the watershed, flows can increase and make approaching, the, can increase very quickly and make approaching the stream very dangerous, um, especially with the onset of a rainstorm. Uh, I want to direct your attention to this photo on the slide, and, and in the bottom of the photo, you can see a stream flowing by. Uh, on the top of the photo, there's a, a red circle around a piece of garbage in the, in the tree. Uh, so this is an, a very urban stream. Um, it's a little oasis called Renfrew Ravine in Vancouver. Uh, but it is, uh, like I mentioned, this stream is attached to the stormwater system, so all kinds of debris comes floating down it. Um, but the point I want to make here is that the distance between the bottom uh, of the stream bed and this piece of garbage in the tree is six feet. Uh, and that garbage got in the tree because it was flowing in water uh, that was that deep. 
So in a, in a heavy rainstorm that can happen very quickly uh, here in Vancouver, uh, the water can rise that, that uh, depth in a very short period of time. So if you were on the banks of that stream, uh, you might, um, uh, you, you could get trapped there or swept away, all of those dangerous things. Uh, so it's, it's very important to be aware of what kind of conditions you might expect when you're going out into the, into the field. Um, if the stream level is very high and there's nowhere with stable footing to approach a stream, then just don't sample. Uh, it's not worth it. Um, if you're near a bridge, however, you can drop a bucket over the bridge to collect the water and then sample from that bucket if the flows are too high. Um, one thing to be aware of in a stream like this is once it starts raining, um, particularly if you're unfamiliar with the site, the, um, the water can get quite muddy and you don't actually know what's on the bottom of the stream anymore how deep it is, so that's an additional hazard to consider. Can any? Uh, in urban areas, we often find um, garbage, including broken glass and used needles uh, around the streams. Um, they are, we are always so prepared to find these items and to collect them so that they don't pose a risk for uh, for others who come to the site after us. Um, you can, for a very um, small amount of money, get sharp containers um, in the mail and then you can um, dispose of them appropriately in your, your local communities. Um, you might also see, see things like this culvert or metal drains and spaces that are easily accessible. Uh, so they are attractive to students and volunteers because they make really fantastic echoes if you yell into them. Uh, but they also are often full of, of debris and very dark. So it would be um, uh, somewhat treacherous probably to enter one of these, particularly during a storm. I wanted to emphasize the connections that uh, you can make with your community and how much those can benefit you. Um, so switching gears a little bit, um, but it is a really important part of a program like Uncover Your Creeks and can be also very important of a, a program that you might run out of the school or community center. Um, if you're just beginning a water quality sampling program, there might be a local group who can help you by providing resources and support, um, for example, everything uh, through the Uncover Your Creeks program. In Toronto, there's EcoSpark, uh, their changing current program. Uh, and in the US, there's the Extension Volunteer Water Quality Monitoring Network. Uh, I'm not especially familiar with that one, uh, but we will provide the link to it uh, at the end of the presentation. We partner with schools, with community groups, uh, other nonprofits and local governments, which allows us to benefit from a suite of in-kind support without which our program would not be possible, certainly. Um, they help us without us having to pay for it with promotion, site selection, uh, disposal of invasive species and removal of problem trees uh, from our site to make it a, a safe place for, for our volunteers to work. Um, I would suggest investigating who else is doing this kind of work in your area and what support they can provide, uh, materials and data and on-site supervision that might even be able to lead special events for you um, with, with expertise that they, they might have specific to that watershed or the local area. I've seen a few comments come up in the chat box um, from people who look like they're doing this kind of work already, so perhaps you can be resources for one another, which would be wonderful. So making a plan to start doing this kind of work. Um, the very basics are asking yourself these three, three questions. What do you want to do? Who are you going to do it for? And where will you do it? Um, determining the goals of your study uh, is you know, the, the foundation of what you want to, to start with. Um, are you going to be monitoring for pollution? Are you going to be diagnosing the water body health? Are you doing this simply to raise awareness amongst your, your participants? Uh, or to provide a new experience for them or yourself. Um, depending on your objectives, their research and preparation might vary for your program. Who are you doing it for? Um, data collection for another group or municipality? Are you helping to augment their data set? Are you doing it for education for your students or the youth group? Your own research? Um, this will affect how rigorous and detailed the data collection needs to be. So for example, 
uh, the the water quality kit that we use, which I'll I'll tell you about a little bit later uh, in more detail, um, it is accurate, but it's not very precise. Uh, it does tell us what's in the water and how much is there, but not to any significant digits. Um, so we're we're mostly using it as a way to educate people who participate in the program. Uh, we're also providing that data to our municipal and community partners so that they can use it to look for spikes in particular parameters in case they want to address that, um, address a certain event that has happened in the watershed. And where will you do it? Um, it's important to identify your watershed uh, and understand the area that you're going to be working in. Learn a bit of the history to provide some context to the sampling. When I tell our volunteers that there used to be salmon runs so thick in Still Creek, this is one of the streams that we work in regularly, that you could walk across the stream in the fall without uh, even touching the water, people are, are really surprised. And people just come down to the stream and grab salmon out of the, the uh, stream for their dinner just because they were so abundant. And now it's one of the most polluted streams in, in all of North America. Until the last two years, um, because of stewardship efforts that have been going on, um, the salmon returned in 2012 for the first time, uh, and again last year. So there is hope for, for these uh, degraded urban streams. Anyway, I think um, when planning your study, uh, after you've identified your watershed and the area that you think might be, might be great to work, which could be quite easy if it's just going past your school or community center, uh, you want to visit the site, determine the hazards, and how you will achieve your goals. Um, make sure as well to get the appropriate permission. Most urban stream corridors are the jurisdiction of the local or regional government, and they might have restrictions regarding where and when you can access that stream. You will also have to make sure that your institution will ensure you to visit the stream in the event of an incident. Organizations like Evergreen hold insurance for all of their participants, so that could be another benefit of partnering with a local group who does this kind of thing regularly. Taking action, getting out there and actually doing it. So when you're out preparing for your, for your um, sampling or you have your group there, take, take some time to explore the site, evaluate the land uses in the watershed or around the site you're sampling from, and develop a foundational understanding of what you might see at the site before you're visiting uh, and why you're seeing those things. Um, this will help you achieve your goals and know what to expect when you're leading your group there. And we'll also give you good background knowledge and bring context to the work. And the more history and anecdotes I tell people and out in the field with them, the more connected they feel to that watershed and, and more passionate about doing things to improve it. When you're visiting the site, uh, evaluate the basics. What does the riverbank look like? Why might it look that way? Um, what does the water smell like? In the city here, it often smells like, to be frank, sewage. Uh, it smells like like streets and and very kind of um, dirty. It doesn't it doesn't smell like you're out in the forest. Uh, so those are important things to note and help you understand your your watershed uh, more deeply. Take a look at the water. Uh, what does it look like? Uh, as well, uh, deciding what kinds of water quality parameters you want to examine and why. And I have a, a slide dedicated totally to that just after this, one, so we'll talk about that in a second. And you may want to incorporate other studies into what you're looking at. Um, for example, benthic invertebrates. It is a more detailed study, but it does get at uh, what is living in the stream. Um, and it's highly interactive, gets the students in the water and examining life. So more on a biology bent than a chemistry one. So what is water quality? Uh, it is the chemical, physical, and biological characteristics of the water. You can see the uh, blue highlights on the, the right-hand side of the questions I have listed here. And these are the parameters that we measure through our Uncovered Seeds program. Uh, they are all parameters that you can measure on site. You can get the results within uh, five minutes or so, with the exception of coliform, which has to incubate for two days, uh, and benthic invertebrates, which is a detailed study. So these are the three basic uh, areas that you would look at to get a picture of, of water health. And like I say, you can do this sample one time and, and do all these things to get a snapshot of what's going on, or you can sample these things on an ongoing basis and create charts and, and use those to analyze the, the water quality. A 
few tricks of the trade that we have learned uh, in our time. And some questions that we've asked ourselves here at Evergreen before we started doing this work, um, particularly with schools. So what if your school is not within walking distance of the stream? Well, um, where, where that has occurred, we've picked up some water at a local stream on our way to the school. Um, we take the, the water into the classroom and we do the sampling there. Uh, alternatively, we uh, take a walk around the, around the schoolyard or around the block and we take a look at what kind of surfaces are, are in the watershed and what kind of things the water might interact with on its way from the sky to the stream. And the reason we do this is that our emphasis is particularly on urban watersheds. So we're really looking at what happens to the water in the city as it moves, as it moves through the stormwater system. Um, what if the river is very large and dangerous to approach? I mentioned this very briefly earlier. You can simply drop, drop a bucket over a bridge uh, and do something either on the bridge or take the water back to your, to your classroom. And that can affect some uh, parameters like turbidity and temperature um, if you are doing the sampling away from the stream, but you can get the general idea of what the water quality is. Can we walk around in the stream as a class? I have put a firm no on this question, uh, even though it is probably the most appealing thing to do when you're beside the stream is to walk into it. And the reason I put a firm no on it is that here in Vancouver, there are very sensitive uh, fish spawns uh, that go on, and they, they do that in the gravel on the base of the stream. So in the background of this photo, on the slide, you can actually see some, some gravel down in the left corner there, and that's the perfect spawning habitat for fish. So we tend not to enter the stream, so we're not disturbing uh, anything, and we just put a general rule on it all year long, no entering the stream. We can grab our samples from the bank uh, and leave all of the, the critters in there um, to their own, their own um, lives in there. And um, can you take water from anywhere in the stream? Um, this is where I'm going to get a little bit technical because I, uh, this is some of the things that I studied. Uh, so it's a very brief conversation, but um, kind of fun. Oh, I'm having trouble advancing my slides. Here we go. So, can you take water from anywhere in the stream? The most accurate place you're going to get water from, uh, or the most accurate data you will get, will come from the foul leg or the main stem of the flow. So these red lines you can see at the edge of the stream are the, just the, the banks of the stream. And then this squiggly orange line is a line that follows the most concentrated part of the flow. Now this stream is one in North Vancouver called Flag Creek, uh, and it's quite steep, and it flows concentrated. The, the channel is narrow, so a lot of the water is in, in the same place as it flows to. So it's, it's more or less obvious where to sample in this, in this stream. This one, however, um, it's very wide and spread out, and this is still creek that we were talking about before. Up near this big green check mark where it is the most ideal place to sample, the stream is narrower and all the flow is concentrated in one channel. But then you break, you come down closer to the bottom of the photo here, and to your right is this first out over rock, and there's a pool on your left that has a piece of an engine in it. Um, so that's not a very good place to sample in the stream because you'll have different water quality in this moving water on the right than you would on the still water on the left. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and talk to, uh, um, about meaningful, uh, how you can make this work meaningful. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard about the studies about getting kids outside in nature and combating nature deficit, deficit disorder, um, as well as uh, something interesting I read, I think, last year about individuals being prescribed walks in the forest in Japan as treatment for ailments. They simply just weren't getting outside enough. So this is the type of work that gets people outside it connects children and volunteers with nature. It's an opportunity to connect with streams and the larger systems they're a part of, the stormwater systems, ecosystems, the drinking water and the sewage. These urban streams are all part of that larger system. Uh, and, and going out and looking at these things um, demonstrates ways that people can take action in their homes and in their communities. As a group, there are many ways that you can take action. You're a class or a youth group or at your community center. Uh, partnering with local stewardship groups. 
Uh, we have many here. There's the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup, who, who do shoreline cleanups along rivers and lakes and, and the ocean. Um, there are many groups who do focus riparian restoration and fish rearing and relief at hatcheries, storm drain marking. So you might have seen yellow fish or, or colored fish painted above the storm water drain. And that's to indicate that anything that goes down that storm drain is connected to a fish habitat. Um, all of these actions can raise awareness and improve water quality in cities. You can also present your project to the city councillor. Um, we, we go at great length to maintain good relationships with our municipalities so they know what we're doing and so we can further their work and they can further ours. Um, put up a presentation uh, at your community center uh, or give one to another class in your school or another community group who might want to be involved in the work you're doing. And don't be afraid to share your data with other groups uh, who are conducting studies. Even if you don't use exactly the same methods, it can be quite informative. And some actions that individuals can, can take at home. Um, removing permeable surfaces from your, your property. So if you have an asphalt driveway, you can put an interlocking stone instead, and that allows water to percolate through and um, reduces the very fast and high flows that would happen in streams like Still Creek. Um, keep a rain barrel on site so you can water in the, in the summer and you don't have to draw down reservoirs like the ones we have here in Vancouver uh, in the dry summer months. Don't dump anything in storm drains. I, I biked past someone in an alley a few months ago and he had filled some gas behind uh, his house and he was hosing it off of the, the driveway into the storm drain. And if it hadn't been very dark and me by myself in an alley along with him, I would have confronted him. Um, and instead, I just tell you about it and to, to uh, be wary of similar things. And something very simple I often tell participants in our program is to just talk to your neighbors. If you learn what watershed you're in, if you learn what an invasive plant is, if you're out and you see some salmon spawning somewhere, um, just tell your neighbor about it. And, and uh, something very simple like having a conversation can get people interested in, in work like this. The benefits of, of work like this um, are, are abound. Um, water quality monitoring is valued for a lot of reasons. And, can be connected to larger themes in the classrooms, like learning about habitats in general. Um, watersheds, which is a big focus of the program that we do here. Um, biodiversity, so healthy waterways support more wildlife. Removing invasive plants from the riparian area and restoring native plant populations improves biodiversity in stream corridors and urban areas uh, and in rural areas. Um, in urban environments, most streams are connected to the stormwater system, which I mentioned. Um, so that means that water flowing over our streets, over buildings, over houses and parks flows through the stormwater unfiltered into rivers. So everything that is on all of those just makes its way into rivers. Um, in many cities around the world, streams that once held fish and supported wildlife now are lifeless in the street of where they've been encapsulated for many years um, and convey stormwater and some cases of sewage. Um, for those of you in Toronto, I encourage you to look at the organization Off the Rivers. So they've done some really incredible work. And in fact, there is um, a film out recently called Lost Rivers. So that brings a lot of insight to urban watersheds. As well, um, this program, not only for us, but for participants uh, and our partners, has been a great way to connect with other people in the community, uh, as well to connect with nature and really give people a sense of responsibility and ownership over these spaces in the city. Um, without them, uh, in fact, they've just been approached by the city of Vancouver to help restore other parts of Still Creek because they simply don't have the capacity to, to go out there and do it. Um, so by getting volunteer power, um, you know, municipalities and groups like us get the benefit of getting people out there and having the work done. But the participants also um, have the benefit of learning about all of these things and connecting with others with similar interests and, and getting outside. So uh, we have a list of resources here. Um, several come from Evergreen, but others are, are from other areas around the, um, North America. Um, one I wanted to point out that I mentioned earlier is Lamotte, and that's where we got the kit that we are using for, for this water quality sampling. Um, it's a, a very easy to use kit. Anybody can, can pick it up, read the instructions, and take water quality samples. 
And that's one of the reasons we used it is that while we don't get very precise results, it's a very unintimidating way for people to enter into this kind of conversation and education. As well, in Vancouver and through this program, we're really trying to encourage people to, to learn what watershed they live in because we are all in watersheds all the time. And uh, if you're thinking about that, then you're less likely to be something like uh, hose gas down your uh, nearest storm drain from your, your alleyway. Uh, Canadian Geographic has a wonderful resource that, that gets you in on your, your high level watershed. Um, larger watersheds are part of that system. Uh, and you can speak to your local municipality or local nonprofit, uh, local hatchery, and they're likely to know the smaller creek in which you might live depending on, on uh, what street you're on. There's also the US EPA Steer Pure Watershed, which I haven't used, um, but I presume it's something similar to what Canadian Geographic has come up with. And that's all for me, Tim. Uh, if people have questions, I'm more than happy to uh, to chat. Thank you, Dana. That was a fabulous presentation, and uh, uh, I learned quite a bit even this time around after doing the practice session with you the other day. That was fantastic. And you may not be aware of it, uh, but I was able, when you asked the question, how many people uh, have had some experience with uh, water quality monitoring, of course, that filled the chat box. and which you may not be aware of is that we have people from, well, Whitehorse, Yukon, adjacent to Alaska, all the way down to the west coast of, uh, of the US, right across to uh, North Carolina, Texas, and points in between, or Illinois, I think, Pennsylvania, I saw. But many, many people who have uh, lots of experience in water quality monitoring. And so, uh, so I suspect we have as many experts as we have participants. And uh, I'd want to make good use of that as we turn now to questions. If you have questions, uh, please type them into the chat box. But I'm also interested, given how many people here have experience uh, in these kind of programs. I know, Bob Sharp, you mentioned that you, and I'm certainly familiar with your work for more than 20 years up in, up in the Yukon. Um, so some, there are many experts here. And I'm also interested in kind of what questions you get asked by teachers, by youth leaders who are signing up for your own programs wherever you're located, because those are likely the same challenges that those who aren't experts who are, who are on this webinar tonight are, are facing in their own communities. So please feel free to share those in the chat box as well. And again, if you join us late, it's to put something in the chat box. It's and type something into the blank horizontal box in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Hit enter on your keyboard, and that will propel it up into the uh, the chat box. And I see that uh, Kim Timberley has already uh, put up the uh, URL for the World Water Mon Monitoring Challenge uh, that has kits and information. And of course, thank you, Dana, for putting up this. Uh, this slide uh, of resources, um, uh, primarily Canadian, although I see Lamont in there and uh, into the US EPA site. Uh, the US EPA used to do a lot more on watersheds uh, for years. We uh, promoted uh, uh, their volunteer monitor newsletter. And, uh, and tomorrow, by the way, when we send out, I did mention earlier, sorry for being a bit long-winded here, well, uh, but I'm giving each of you a little more time to type in the questions in the chat box. Um, that uh, the question that that uh, we published an article uh, tomorrow when we send out the follow-up email to this webinar uh, and announcing that the archive version is open. We did. Uh, we will send out an article that we published just a couple of years ago about uh, uh, water quality monitoring programs in North America, and they list literally dozens of programs across the US and several in Canada. And I hope that article uh, will be useful to all of you in the work that you're doing. Anyways, one question uh, Bob just asked a moment ago is uh, um, that, uh, and Kate has already answered it, is it possible to get in touch with the other participants? And Kate, you've obviously uh, more savvy than many of us. If you right click onto the name, you can do a private chat with anyone. That's exactly right. And, uh, and if you're interested in getting you know, particular people's emails afterwards, I'm going to take that as uh, that I'm 
you know, as authorization that I will do that for for a handful of people here uh, that are interested in, in chatting with others. You're more than welcome to do that. Um, Dana, probably I'll start with you. Uh, you know, what's the question that you get asked most often when you do workshops with, with teachers or youth leaders that are that don't work in schools? Well, you know, it's a very basic one. Um, the majority of people who participate in non Creek don't know what watershed they live in. Uh, and it's the question that we pose to people and then they pose back to us. <laughs> we try to be familiar with what the local watersheds are in the areas we're working in um, and and try to let people know as best as possible what stream either flows or used to flow very near to them. In the cities, both of streams are now underneath our streets. In Vancouver, there used to be 50, over 50 salmon bearing streams and now they are all except for two in culverts under the city. So uh, that's that's probably the, the number one question. Um, with respect to, to from the more administrative side, um, it's, it's more how do we get people involved? So that is um, a very diligent promotion of our programs. Uh, we are on the phone a lot, we use social media a lot. Uh, and we have worked very hard to develop a, a network here in Vancouver of people who are interested and know others who are interested. Great. And do you, um, I, we already have a question now in the chat box uh, uh, that uh, Peggy is asking about the Lamotte kit. Are you familiar with the Lamotte kits? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, more data? or less. I'm, I'm most familiar with the one we use, which is the green kit. Um, and the, the parameters that I listed before, um, so pH, phosphate, nitrate, um, uh, dissolved oxygen, turbidity, temperature, and I'm missing one. Um, That's okay. You can keep yeah. going. Anyway, they are, there's a, um, in that particular kit that we're using, there are, there are seven parameters that we measure. Um, and you can do, I think, a hundred uh, or more of each of those with that particular kit. There are other kits that are similarly easy to use that are more focused uh, particularly on pollution or particularly on metals and that kind of thing. Um, so they are, I would encourage you to go to their website and, and look at what the options are there. Um, they're also very great on the phone. Um, and do their best to get things to you cheaply if you're in Canada because they are in, in the state. And Dana, while you were talking, you, the uh, the first the initial question about Lamont has triggered uh, several comments uh, and a couple more questions. I don't know if you have a chance to read them, but one was, you know, can you make any recommendations for something that's a step up from the the green Lamont kits uh, to something that can gather a little better quality data? Uh, and as is suggested, perhaps an inexpensive probe or meter for school use. Um, I don't. I don't have any experience in kind of the middle range. Um, this is a very entry level kit that we're using, and my other experience are very high level kits in the academic and, and consulting world. I do know, however, that there are kits out there, or sorry, probes out there that. Um, can measure things like conductivity and, and temperature uh, very easily. They would likely be in the you know five hundred dollar range, uh, three to five hundred dollars, um, to measure things like like phosphate and nitrate and dissolved oxygen. You need to do an on-site test. So the downside to uh, sorry dissolved oxygen you can do with the probe. Um, but the downside to a probe is it does limit you to the number of parameters you can test, um, particularly with a less expensive one. It was uh, that your your comment about uh, about uh, the prices was important there because that's uh, that certainly takes it out of the range of of many schools. One of the people who answered the question in the chat box talks about the Vernier LabQuest, and and someone else points out that they've used it uh, and that they've created a, a, a particular kit for school use. And that they're very supportive of do making donations uh, f so that kids can use it. Are you familiar with the Vernier LabQuest? I'm not personally. No. 
Okay, so we'll take that as a recommendation. Thank you, Amy. And someone else uh, asked a question, I guess, from, from Stanley Park in your backyard, Dana. Uh, comments about the quality of the, of the Lamotte test kits. Um, they found that some of the tests are not at a scale that changes over time. And have you ever tried calibrating them with higher resolution instruments? Not yet. Uh, that is something that we're, we're working towards. Uh, as we further develop our program. However, the, the, the core of our program is the education and awareness piece. Um, the bulk of people who, who come out and participate don't even know that a stream flows about three blocks from their house. So we're focusing on getting people just basic watershed literacy. Uh, and the Lamont kit is, is completely suitable for that. Um, I did mention that we we're sharing our data with with municipalities and our partners, and they are aware of the limitations of the, the data coming out of these kits. Um, but we have seen spikes in things like uh, temperature and turbidity that have been useful for them um, through these, these kits. Great. And there's also a question that has been just asked by uh, Peggy as well. Thank you, Peggy, for your second question here. Um, she's asked, have any students, and this kind of feeds on your last answer, Dana, about really what's important, and it's the, the awareness of watersheds and the appreciation of watersheds and how they flow in some ways is way more important than the actual data that they collect. But obviously the two go hand in hand. But flowing from that, once kids have collected that data and they've got a sense of their watershed and they've started taking some ownership about it, have you, are you familiar, are, there, are any of the groups of students that you've worked with, have they ever presented their data uh, to a municipality or other organization? Um, there is a, a high school adjacent to Renfrew Ravine, which is one of our, our flagship sites uh, called Engineer High School, and they have worked closely with municipality and a local, um, a local not-for-profit to map the, the ravine, to um, um, look at unstable sites, to map the, the water quality, to sample the water quality, uh, and they have shared that with municipal uh, staff, um, as well as anyone else who's interested. Um, uh, we also provide all of that in reports to, to our municipal and regional governments. Right. But of course, the benefit of having students doing it is that then they, they really have to double check their data. They have to think about the writing of their submissions. Uh, and certainly, the more the kids start trying to convince adults that changes need to be done in a stream, uh, you know, of course, it's one thing if you or I are standing in front of a group of politicians, but when there's a 12-year-old, a passionate 12-year-old who's, who's, who's done their research and done their homework and is uh, passionate about the need to clean up a, an urban river or an urban stream, that certainly gets the attention and often gets the, uh, often is far more persuasive than when, when older, when adults uh, jump in as, as we often do. That's right. That's right. Another question that uh, Katie's asking uh, is, has anyone developed a, a database that students can use, students in a program can use to enter data and then compare that data? Is that happening in, in, uh, in your program yet? We're developing our own database. Uh, and in fact, we'll be launching our uncoveryourcreeks.ca website. Um, people will be able to submit any data that they've collected or look at our data on that on that website, and it will be a compilation of data that we've collected from watersheds across um, Metro Vancouver, so uh, quite localized um, in that regard. Um, I'm unaware of other larger scale databases, although uh, I would suspect that the Water Quality Monitoring uh, Network has a database like that. There's also um, Earthwatch Institute. They are right now taking part in a program that is sponsored by HSBC, uh, and uh, they are collecting water quality data globally and inputting that into a database. Um, that uh, I don't actually know what the steps after their collection of the data from around the world will be, but they are, are collecting data from urban areas around the world. That's great. And there's actually a comment in the chat box uh, by Amy about uh, an organization based out of Portland, just south of you, called Stream, that has streamwebs.org as their website. And as Amy points out, you can post your data and upload photos and videos, which, which uh, she does already with her students. And uh, 
So that's certainly, and, and I was impressed, Amy, that you mentioned that you videotape student presentations, post them on social media sites and websites, and uh, as well as, of course, uploading them to the streamwebs.org website. That's terrific. And uh, your, the follow-up comment is, yes, it's a site for Oregon uh, students based in Oregon, um, but, uh, but perhaps there are similar uh, opportunities in other states and provinces as well. And there was Katie, also, go ahead. Sorry, Ken. There was also an app that I had on my phone called Creek Watch, and it was based out of California. And what it was was uh, encouraging people to, anytime they walked past the stream uh, or saw anything unusual on a local stream, to take a photo of it and upload it, including the the weather and the observations that they made and, and other characteristics that they observed to that uh, database. So very simple way to get people involved in, in observing their, their environment in their, in their uh, local watershed. Great. And Kimberly has added as well to the discussion that there's a reminder that the World Water Monitoring website that provides annual data and uh, that's often very useful for people who are doing doing studies and uh, so that's a definitely uh, something to, to pay attention to as well and I think if people Google world water quality um, monitoring, uh, wet, world water quality monitoring they will find that website. Um, I'm just trying to check see if we have any other programs or any other questions here. Um, and thank you, Bob. Yes, also developing an app to, to classify water quality using macro invertebrate analysis. That's terrific. Um, folks, are there other, uh, those of us here, are there others who are, um, uh, who are also developing, are aware of other programs where kids uh, upload data and make presentations to government and so far, they'd be very interested. Um, and Bob, thank you. Goal B gov collects data from around the world. That's another good website. Thank you for mentioning it. I'm just checking to see if there's other questions. I have one other kind of question that someone's asked is uh, Jan was asking about whether she can get a uh, education certificate for her certification program. And yes, you can send a, an email to info at greenteacher.com. I think there was an opportunity to uh, sign up for a certificate. I think we charge five dollars for it just because we don't charge for the webinars, but it does take time to make the certificates and send them off. But if you send an, in, an email to info at greenteacher.com, Isabel Sloan in the Green Teacher office tomorrow will happily take care of you. Um, okay, and uh, Karen's asking a question uh, about slide 28. Uh, Dana, I don't know if you can go back to it, um, but she was asking by permeable, do you mean surfaces that let water through. That's exactly right, Karen. Um, uh, permeable like um, like a lawn or even gravel or, or like I mentioned um, on this slide, interlocking stone that don't block water from, from percolating or infiltrating into the ground. Um, and the reason that's important is that if water flows very quickly over an impermeable surface, it, it moves very rapidly to, through the stormwater system and into streams, and that's what causes the very quick rises in water level in, in urban streams, uh, versus if, the, if cities were covered in permeable surfaces, that water would infiltrate and slowly make its way to those streams and have more of a uh, gradual rise in water level, which is what you would see in an undeveloped stream system. And we have, I'm, I'm the chair of a neighborhood association here in downtown Toronto, Dana, and we are just about, we have a, a laneways, in a down, dense downtown neighborhood, we have lots of laneways that are all paved that, that uh, and we're now, uh, many of them are needing to be repaved and we're now in the throes of beginning to have the concrete removed and putting in permeable pavers that allow water to percolate through just as you described so that we can start recharging the groundwater in our neighborhoods mm -hmm. and, uh, and reducing the water, the water load on our streams and ultimately that should help improve water quality in the streams that, that, uh, that remain. The, um, uh, by the way, Bob did clarify that it was not, uh, uh, it should, the website he was referring to was globe.gov and that presumably is the, the globe program I'm assuming, Bob, but uh, Catherine, just another question. Several people have asked this too about uh, are you going to have a chance 
those who've arrived late will they have a chance to uh, to catch up in, in on the webinar the part that they've missed the answer is yes and tomorrow we will send all of you an email and to many more who signed up uh, for the webinar and hope to watch the archive version in the next week or two we'll send you the details about just how to do that and uh, plus the resources that Dana has uh, displayed a few minutes ago and I will try and capture in the chat box all of the resources that that uh, you guys have mentioned and we'll send that out to everyone as well so that everyone who views the archive version in the next week or two or and it's available for 30 days for free uh, can can uh, benefit from all of the uh, suggestions that each of you have made so don't worry about uh, not if you miss some of the uh, um, uh, you know some of the some of the uh, webinar. I see a follow-up question from Karen about the permeable surfaces, and that's exactly right, Karen. You would want to remove impermeable surfaces. Um, I always find a typo in things that are published. published and you found this one. And I missed that one too. But uh, mm -hmm. but listen, I think this is time we should probably. I'll get you to hit the record button again and. Uh, Actually, I've got to, before you do that, don't do that yet. I'm going okay. to, I've, I've been so enthused with the, I haven't taken anyone to the, uh, I, I want to ask everyone if you wouldn't mind uh, before before you go to uh, take a moment and uh, have a look at, uh, if you could uh, uh, have a look in, at this uh, survey that I'm just typing the URL in very slowly here. And, uh, if you would indulge us in filling out this end of webinar survey, I'd be very appreciative. You know, what did you like and dislike about the, uh, oops, I don't think I got that right. Let me try it again. Um, oh, I see what I did wrong. Okay, just here we go. So here's our survey, and if you wouldn't mind, uh, those of you who are still with us, take up, it takes about 90 seconds to fill it out. Uh, if you have other questions and you want to ask, we'd be happy to uh, happy to answer them while you're doing that. Uh, and uh, but a, a big thanks to all of you for taking the time to join us tonight and uh, and, and for sharing your suggestions and questions in the chat box. Um, and a big thanks to you, Dana, for a fabulous presentation. That was really really terrific. And I'm not sure uh, while people are. Um, uh, filling out the survey, uh, and before we hit the record button, I want to come back to you just to talk a little bit about Evergreen because uh, I was encouraging you to, to do that towards the end of your presentation rather at the beginning. Is there more things you would like to say? Um, I, I got to the bulk of it there. Um, we do have a number of other programs uh, besides Green Space. Um, in Toronto, our office is somewhere around 80 to 100 staff. Um, so there are a lot of things going on there, and anyone who lives in Toronto or the surrounding area who who hasn't been down to the Evergreen Brickworks, I would encourage you to go there and check out either the on-site uh, programming. There are, are a number of of green space oriented programs that happen there, uh, as well as around the the GTA. Um, we also do a number of food programs um, and community development types type programs, and we have begun a City Works program as well. That is, um, uh, our City Works initiative that is is more on uh, an urban focus and, and the research focus. Um, here in Vancouver, we have eight people in our office, so uh, quite small in comparison to to the Toronto office. And um, we work on uh, we have community gardens um, that. Um, the, the kind of core of that is intergenerational learning uh, and and learning to uh, garden in all seasons in this, in this region uh, and our green space program, which uh, the bulk of which is on Trevor Face, and then we have um, um, one that is a dedicated program in North Vancouver uh, as well called the City Park Stewards Program that's been running for over 10 years now. Well, fantastic, and and we have uh, I think uh, Bob up in the Yukon was the only other Canadian on besides the two of us, but we had great representation from across the U.S. all corners, and and from people who had a lot of experience in water quality monitoring. We have a really talented group. Sorry, and someone's just said no. I'm from Coburg, Ontario, so mm -hmm. thank you. But Evergreen.ca is the website if you're interested in learning more about the about what is 
one of our most innovative uh, education organizations here in Canada. Um, but thank you, everyone, for joining us. We will be announcing in the next few days several new webinars. Uh, and hope, Dana, we can uh, bring you back again uh, to uh, share some of your expertise. Really appreciate your effort tonight. That would be wonderful. And thank you, Tim, and uh, everyone at Green Teacher for, for having me. And to Lisa, who's joining us from Toronto, although it was silent because of some speaker problems. Um, thank you for connecting me uh, with Tim and Green Teacher and to everyone for participating uh, in the webinar tonight. Great. I'm just going to hit the uh, recording button here. <laughs>